Hello everyone, I am going to review Planet of the Humans documentary produced by Michael Moore and directed by Jeff Gibbs. Michael Moore is well regarded in the progressive and environmental communities. So it came in as a bit of a surprise to both the climate change believers and deniers that the movie was critical of the green energy movement. This review is going to be split into three parts. Number one, factual mistakes. Number two, misleading information. And number three, reasonable arguments. Factual mistakes are mistakes that can be easily verified to be factually wrong. This is not something to be expected from an Oscar award-winning producer. I've highlighted three factual errors that I came across. The first factual mistake in the documentary was that it caught the contribution of renewable energy in the total energy consumed by Germany wrong. Germany has been in the forefront of renewable energy for decades. So it was surprising that the documentary claimed that only about 4.5% of Germany's energy consumption was contributed by clean sources. Upon checking in the International Energy Agency, which is an autonomous organization, I found that, that this mix was closer to 15%. And as is evident from the chart, the only time that this metric is close to 4.5% is way back in 2002. Factual mistake number two. As we will discuss later on, the documentary goes all in on biomass energy, but it overestimates its contribution within the renewable energy space. The documentary suggests that biomass contributes close to 70% of total global renewable energy. But once again, checking in the IEA website reveals that wind is the largest contributor of green energy. Biomass formed less than a quarter of total contribution in 2017. Once again, looking at the graph, we can see that biomass used to be big in the early 2000s or prior to that but its contribution has become lesser and lesser as wind and solar have become more mainstream. Factual mistake number three. The documentary wrongly claims that manufacturing renewable energy components such as wind turbines or solar panels are so energy intensive that even this energy can't be recouped by running these devices. This question has already been addressed by the scientific community. A term called energy payback period is used to represent the time it takes for a certain energy source to generate the energy needed to manufacture and install it. USA's Natural Resources Energy Lab, NREL, showed back in 2004 that the payback period for multi-crystalline solar panels, which are the most widely used, with prevalent technologies was three and a half years and it expected it to reduce to two years with technological advances. Essentially what this means is that the solar panels would have generated sufficient electricity that was needed to manufacture it within two years and all the electricity after that would be carbon free. Similar research on wind technologies have shown that the payback period can be as low as one year. Moving on to section 2, misleading information. Here we will talk about the claims that are made in the documentary that are in fact true but are not relevant in today's technological advancements. I'll be discussing two examples in this section. Argument number one. The makers say that EVs are not sustainable since the electricity they use is primarily generated by coal. They are either ignorant or have conveniently forgotten that our electricity itself is being made cleaner through green sources so that EVs will be driven off of clean energy in the near future. Companies such as Tesla are driving towards that clean energy generation and consumption economy. Argument number two. The documentary implies that even with so much impetus on clean energy, Conventional energy needs to be kept on to support base load forever. The makers hone in on the fact that current forms of renewable energy is intermittent. Therefore, conventional energy sources such as coal are needed when renewable energy can't be generated during the off periods. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't start switching over to green energy 
so that we can greenify our grid to the extent possible. The documentary also doesn't bring up the fact that this is going to be in the interim until energy storage becomes economical. Section 3 Reasonable Arguments In this section, we cover topics that were discussed in the documentary which are reasonable and are worth further exploration. Argument number 1 the documentary spends quite some time looking into the biomass industry to bring awareness to the fact that biomass, once thought to be carbon neutral, is actually not so, at least in the way it's been currently practiced. According to current research, older trees can capture far more carbon than the younger ones. Therefore, the current practice of cutting down virgin forests, making chips out of them and plant new trees in their place will no longer be carbon neutral. It's good that the documentary has drawn attention to the biomass industry. But what's not so good here is that it projects Bill McKibben, one of the initial supporters, as a culprit in making this mainstream. Whereas, in fact, Bill wrote an op-ed in New Yorker last year showing his change of mind about the biomass industry. This was conveniently missed in the documentary. Reasonable argument number two. There is some truth to the characterization of sustainable investment portfolios by the documentary. There are two topics that are worth further exploration. Number one, most of the pure play clean energy portfolios haven't been performing well even before the pandemic crisis tanked the whole market. So no one will be interested in investing in them. Case in point, ICLN an ETF that is sold by BlackRock and primarily having renewable energy companies such as Emphase, First Solar, etc. And take a look at its performance. What this graph is saying is that if you were to invest $10,000 in June of 2008, you will be left with $2,859 today, meaning that you have lost 71% of your investment. Do you really want to be so deeply out of your pocket in order to support your causes? Number two, as a workaround to the issue mentioned earlier, some asset management companies started using a metric called ESG. ESG stands for Environment, Society and Governance. The ESG rating is done by an independent agency for all listed companies in most of all the global stock exchanges. The problem with this approach is that mainstream companies in mining, banking or IT can obtain a high ESG score by showing that they are doing something good for the environment and that they have good governance practices. To see what is inside a portfolio that has been created with stocks having a very high ESG rating, if we take a look at this portfolio called MXXVX. And as rightly pointed out in the documentary, this portfolio has few bank stocks and few technology stocks which are not really relevant to the green technology revolution. Section 4 Conclusion In all fairness, Michael Moore is not a climate change denier. So why then produce such a movie that's filled with factual errors and rejects the progress we have made in the environmental movement? It goes back to one of the core themes Michael Moore brings up in all of his movies, how corporatism is taking over our society with primary objective being to ensure that we continue our excessive consumeristic ways which ensure these corporations profits. The documentary provides examples of biomass billionaires funding environmental organizations, asset management companies supporting clearing of Amazon forests and big banks funding ethanol manufacturing from sugarcane grown in clear-cut forests. Had the documentary focused on the key messages from section 3 of this discussion and gotten their facts straight and not made well-respected environmentalists such as Al Gore and Bill McKibben collateral damage, this documentary would have made the impact that their makers wanted it to make. Thanks for watching the video. Click on the link below for a more detailed review of this topic. Have yourself a nice day.